Good morning. Today is Friday, September 13th, 2024. Alongside the terror, loss, pain we've experienced this past year, and in some ways, things now are bleaker than ever, alongside that, we are seeing incredible strength and resilience not so much from leaders or high-profile people, but from ordinary people, such that we really need to reconfigure our vocabulary. Who and what is a hero? And where to look for them? And most importantly, to try to emulate them, because... These heroes are you and me, just in very extreme circumstances. But they, as people, are relatable to us. So what they are capable of, without any experience, without any training, could be what we are capable of when we need it. And allow me to share this morning two examples. I shared this with some of you before. The week before, when we learned the terrible news that six hostages in Gaza had been murdered just before the IDF was about to reach them to rescue them, caused fresh, deep agony and pain. One of those six received more attention in the, certainly in North America, because he is an American citizen, his family are Americans, and his family, his mother in particular, Rachel Goldberg Polin has been so public, has been in a certain sense the public face of the families of hostages working on their behalf. And so that family may have received more publicity, but of course the pain was equal for all six. And the way they were mourned in Israel was equally deep and sad. One of the six was Ori Danino. Now, Ori Danino, he was 25 years old when he was killed. His name was much less known to the public because his family explained that He had a background serving in the IDF, in the army, and his family felt, feared, that if they were more public, that he might actually receive more harsh treatment because of his connection to the IDF. But his loss was the loss of an entire world for his family and for his friends and for his community and for the entire Jewish people. His mother's name is Einav. And during the Shiva, she said the following. She said, people ask me, don't you feel lost? All the prayers, all the good deeds... And this is, it doesn't make any difference, but just in terms of the story, this is a religious family that was praying every day, that did convene groups of friends and others to pray on his behalf and that behalf of all those hostages. 
What happened to all those prayers, she was asked? What happened to all the mitzvahs, the good deeds that everyone was doing of increased chesed, increased kindness, increased acts of service to God in the hope that that would be a merit by which their son and the others would come home safely? And people asked her, don't you feel lost? What happened to all of that? And she said, well, maybe that's what protected him for 11 months. And I got him back whole. It was in a coffin, but he came back whole. Families of other hostages come here. I see their suffering. I tell them, if only you could get what I got, that he was killed, and I got him back and buried him. That's not to be taken for granted. Yes, it's crazy, but it's not to be taken for granted. It's a painful end. It's a turbulent time, but we have faith in the creator of the world that what God does is best and right. We carry on despite all the difficulty. What incredible heroism in the depths of sorrow for the murder of her son, to be able to find something to appreciate. The second example comes from an article that was written by Shana Goldberg. It appeared in Times of Israel. And she writes as follows. <clears throat> There have been numerous times over the last 11 months when it has felt difficult to breathe. I think many of us can relate to that. Tuesday night, she's talking about last Tuesday night, was one of those moments. I was listening to a presentation when the video and pictures of the tunnel where six precious fellow Israelis were murdered last week, that video was released to the media. You may have seen it. And it popped up on my phone's update. Now, if you saw that, you will understand how this woman, not related to any of the hostages, just a woman living in Israel, just seeing an illustration of how deep the tunnel runs underground and a picture of how narrow and dark it is was enough to knock the air out of me. How did they breathe down there? The thought of the claustrophobia, the humidity, and the stench made my own breathing feel more labored. She could not breathe. And that was before I allowed myself to think about the overwhelming, life-threatening fear that must have hung over each hostage and about what their families And the family members of all the remaining hostages are going through having to imagine the same because now everyone who wants to has seen that video. It's hard to breathe when you imagine having no air. It's hard to breathe when you think of others taking their last breath. It's hard to breathe when you feel so crushed by a mix of pain and fear and despair, and for a few moments, Shana writes, my stomach churned and I felt myself gasping for air. But then, my lungs began to fill with oxygen. It was the fresh air that was being pumped into the room by Yardane Gonen and Ilay David. 
Okay, so just remember, she was at this presentation. It was a presentation of Yardane and Ile. But she had seen this on her phone and she became almost hysterical, couldn't breathe. And then she started to pay attention to the presentation in the room in which she was located. And she describes that as fresh air being pumped into the room by these two young people. So listen to this. This happened last week. Yarden and Eli are the siblings, respectively, of Romy Gonen and Evyatar David. So Romy and Evyatar were both kidnapped from the Nova Festival on October 7th, taken hostage by Hamas terrorists into Gaza. Yarden and Eli, one is a sibling, each one is a sibling of one of them. So Yarden and Eli had come to Gush Etzion, that's south of Yerushalayim, where Shana is, to this program to share their family stories and to engage in dialogue with the community. Okay, so this is something, and this has been happening all over Israel. So two family members of hostages come to share with a wider group what it is that they're going through. For the last 342 days, sadly that number is higher now, but this is as of last week, they have been plunged into an endless nightmare of agony, uncertainty, instability, longing, and debilitating concern and worry. That part, I think we get. I mean, we can never imagine what they're going through, but I think we can at least say, yes, we, we, we certainly recognize those emotions. And yet, Yardane and Eli began their talk by stating how privileged they feel. Eli spoke about how lucky his family feels that they have videos of Evyatar's kidnapping. He described how they benefited from the clarity of knowing early on that day what had happened to Evyatar, while so many other families had no idea for weeks or months about their relatives' whereabouts. Yardane reiterated a few times how privileged, privileged, she feels to have spoken to Romy for the last time only minutes before the car she was fleeing in was ambushed. Yardane got to hear Romy's voice, to tell Romy how much she loved her, and to make sure her sister knew how deeply she was cared for. So many others did not have that opportunity. And Yardane says she was privileged. Both of them emphasize how grateful they feel that their siblings were taken alive on that fateful day and not murdered, along with close friends who lost lives. The packed room was silent. You could hear a pin drop as they spoke. You could feel people slowly exhale. Shana writes, coming face to face with the resilience of others gives us strength. Seeing and hearing from people who push through adversity literally gives us air. Now, here's the point I'm making. Yardane and Eli are not victorious soldiers. They are not heroes in any popular usage of that word. They are regular people going through something they never imagined and they have risen with no experience, no training, to the most exalted level of heroism we can conceive. Adam Grant 
is a psychologist who has researched this for many years. And he writes that it is possible to find strength in the face of real hardship. Resilience is not something we have, but something that we build over time by changing how we process negative events. It's about learning what it takes for us to find strength in a tough situation and then being able to apply those skills when they are the most needed. Grant adds that adversity, severe adversity, brings real perspective, which is about finding appreciation, recognizing that at any moment, life could be worse, and realizing how fortunate we are to have the good things that we still do. Shana Goldberg adds, <clears throat> listening to Yardane and Eli, I felt a sense of, wow. Wow, that siblings experiencing so much suffering can simultaneously focus on what they are grateful for. Wow, that siblings who have every reason to be bitter and angry, to shout and to vent, can come and speak with a deliberate goal of bringing others together. Wow, that siblings continue to draw strength from their sister and brother in captivity and refuse to give up the fight on their behalf. And wow, that on a night when so many were grasping for breath, we were privileged to be the recipients of so much fresh air. In this very difficult time, they remind us in real and raw ways that even with all the pain and fear and feelings of despair, focusing on what one is grateful for has power. These are true heroes, and we can emulate them in the circumstances of our own lives. My friends, I wish you a good day and a beautiful Shabbos, and I look forward to seeing you soon in person.